takeoff. Okay, let's have a little chat about this medical situation. First of all, the update, uh, my intention is simply to explain my situation because there's been a lot of questions about if I was going to move to Columbia. Some people apparently were considering basing their decision on if they're going to come to Ecuador or not um, on what I decided because I'm here. But please understand that my situation was very unique. There's very few people that actually exist that have the particular kind of coverage that I have through the Veterans Administration in the United States. I have a very rare coverage that pr provides 100% medical and um, pharmaceutical anywhere in the world. The reason I was upset about this was if, if, if the question was, is Ecuador going to try to force me to buy an insurance that I don't need? Now, on the other hand, most people need some sort of insurance. I mean, I have it. Most people need some sort of insurance. So then the question is, is it financially feasible? And only you can answer that. As it stands today, there's private plans that run 100 to 250 a month, depending on whether you're over 65 or not. And from my understanding is that even with a private insurance, they will cover over 65. It's just that the rates will go up and what those are, I don't know. It's your particular, again, your particular situation. Now, the IESS is a program that's, it's a government program. It combines Social Security retirement funds along with medical and dental. So, is it better to have private or is it better to have the, the government plan? Well, I, it depends on who you talk to. Now, and, and the cost. IESS will be all-inclusive, where the private is going to have a lot of limitations uh, to those plans. On the other hand, the feedback that I get on IESS is it can be a frustrating system. You can wait a long time for appointments. I know that there's a lot of people that aren't happy with the level of service. I also know that there's a lot of people that are very happy with it. So it probably, like many things here, depends on who you happen to see on any particular day. It was a shock to a number of people that were paying $76, $80 a month and all of a sudden it, it appeared to be going to $300, $400. And of course there was some outrage over that. I mean that would affect anyone. There still is not a final determination on how they're going to base that for retired people. Here's a concern that I have with this. The Constitution of Ecuador says that all people must be treated the same. And so if you're a citizen or if you're a resident or if you're simply a tourist, that everything applies to people equally. And the problem with the IESS, the way they're talking about it right now, is they want to take people, again, I'm talking retired people, they want to take retired people and base the percentage of cost of the IESS on the retirement benefits that you receive. This is why it's problematic. If you're an Ecuadorian receiving their Social Security and you're retired, that is not treated like pay. That is treated like a retirement fund, essentially a savings account that you've paid into over the course of years and now you're drawing from it. 
all applicable taxes have already been deducted. That's how that's treated. But right now, they're looking at retirees from the United States with the same situation. A retirement fund that they've paid into, it is not pay, it is not a salary. You're simply receiving payments off of your account. If they're going to look at Ecuador as though that's not a salary, therefore not base things on that, then according to the Constitution, they really shouldn't be looking at residents base the amount they charge for IESS on the money they received as though it's pay. The IESS pay system, the 17.6% plus percent if you, if you have a spouse, that's all based on payroll. Employers pay certain amounts and that's what that system is entirely based on. It is not based on retirees receiving retirement benefits. And so if they apply that to the residents, I see that as a huge problem. It looks, it appears to me, my opinion, that it's unconstitutional. I talked to one lawyer friend that I have, and he actually agreed with that. He did a little research. He went down to one of the immigration offices to talk to them directly about the new law. Remember, this is not a health care law. This is an immigration law. So, <clears throat> Summarize, if you need health insurance, just buy the health insurance. You can get it relatively cheap. I've even understood that the local banks have some sort of policy that's only $30 or $40 that's accepted. So if you want to look into that, and I don't have any detail on it, it may not even be true, but I would certainly look into that if you're, if you're one of those people that want to pay as you go anyway. If you have Medicare in the United States, that certainly doesn't apply here because they're not going to reimburse and there's no one here to take care of you on that. So if you need health care, by all means, buy the health care. Look for the best plan for your situation. Worst case, if it's two or three hundred dollars, that's not totally out of line in the scheme of things. Again, in my case, the whole reason I was upset about it and I was looking that I may have to move was because you know, I would not want to pay 300 and some dollars for something that I have no use for. Um, I have been told that mine will probably be accepted and I'm waiting for a letter of verification from the veterans. I should have that any time. Everyone has until the first part of November to get this sort it out and to report that to the immigration office. There's little information about fines and penalties. There's some, nobody knows if that's exactly accurate, kind of wait and see, but you don't want to be in a situation where you're getting fines or penalties. The last thing I'll say on this is if you're basing your decision on whether to come to Ecuador or not on this new law, I wouldn't do that. I, your decision should be much broader. This would only be one part of it. And healthcare is important. So how you decide, you should choose in a, in, in a broader manner. Every place you go is going to have some drawbacks and going to have some pluses. People say the visas are really easy to get here. Well, they're not really easy. They're probably middle of the road. I know several countries in South America that are easier to get, but there's a lot of benefits to coming to Ecuador. So you really have to look at your situation, weigh those things out, and make a choice on the overall picture, not one particular aspect, unless that one particular aspect is a deal breaker. If, for example, your budget is so tight that a $200 a month healthcare plan is out of reach for you, then you shouldn't come. But I will also say this, if your budget is that tight, despite the health care, you shouldn't come because you're going to find when you get here that it's probably not as cheap as you think it is. 
Uh, is it cheaper than San Francisco? Well, absolutely. It's cheaper than San Diego? Absolutely. Is it cheaper than Wheeling, West Virginia? Yeah, probably not. So when you make your decision, do your pluses and minuses, benefits, negatives, positives, do your list and come to an overall decision that works well. Whatever you're budgeting, make sure that you add 20% of that budget or more for just in case things that you didn't expect. Absolutely, if you have questions, go to an expert. Unfortunately, right now, it doesn't seem that there are any experts inside or outside of the government. Even though the law has been signed, they're still working through the details. So, talk to you soon. You know you could.